Welcome to True Crime Case Files. Today's episode takes us aboard a luxurious cruise ship, where a celebration of love and commitment ended in a shocking tragedy. We'll unravel the mystery of a love triangle that turned deadly on the open seas. Join us as we navigate through the turbulent waters of jealousy, passion, and betrayal in the case of Ray Truscott. In the summer of 2001, as the world slowly adjusted to the new millennium, Ray Truscott, a 53-year-old life insurance analyst from Plano, Texas, was preparing to celebrate a milestone that many couples dream of but few reach. His 20th wedding anniversary. Ray, a father of three, was known in his community as a man of integrity and dedication. He had built a stable career at New Life Financial, a reputable firm known for its competitive edge in the bustling Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. A graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, Ray had climbed the ranks through sheer determination and a knack for numbers. His colleagues often described him as the first to arrive and the last to leave the office, a testament to his work ethic. Ray's life at home was no less exemplary. His wife, Dinah, and their children were the center of his world. Neighbors would often see the Truscott family at community events or hear about their travels to places like the Grand Canyon or Disney World the latter being featured in a 2001 Disney vacation planning VHS that had just been released. Ray's personality was a blend of the analytical mind of an insurance analyst and the warm heart of a family man. He was known for his dry wit, often referencing the latest Dilbert comic strip, which amusingly captured the quirks of corporate culture. His dreams, though, were not confined to spreadsheets and actuarial tables. Ray aspired to see his children graduate from college and to one day retire to a quiet life perhaps in the Texas Hill Country, where he and Dinah could enjoy their golden years. In the days leading up to his death, Ray was seen in high spirits, even mentioning to his neighbor about his anticipation for the U2 Elevation Tour concert, scheduled for later that year. He had been meticulously planning the anniversary cruise, set to embark from Galveston, Texas, aboard the majestic Voyager of the Seas, a Royal Caribbean vessel famed for its luxurious amenities and scenic routes. Little did anyone know that this journey, meant to celebrate two decades of love and commitment, would be his last. On the morning of June 15, 2001, as the Voyager of the Seas, a Royal Caribbean cruise liner, cut through the tranquil waters of the Gulf of Mexico, an unsettling discovery was made that would mar the ship's record of idyllic voyages. It was approximately 7.30 a.m. when the body of Ray Truscott, a 53-year-old life insurance analyst from Plano, Texas, was spotted by a fishing boat, the Sea Sprite, captained by Marcus Caldwell. The vessel, a common sight in these waters, was out for its regular trawl when it stumbled upon the grim scene. The weather was uncharacteristically mild for a June morning, with a soft breeze that offered little solace to the crew of the Sea Sprite as they grappled with their find. Captain Caldwell, a seasoned mariner, was taken aback by the sight of the lifeless body bobbing in the gentle swells. His initial shot quickly turned to action as he radioed the Coast Guard, his voice steady but tinged with the gravity of the situation. The crew, maintaining their composure, secured the area to preserve the integrity of what was now a crime scene. The discovery sent ripples through the media, with local news channels like KHU interrupting their regular programming to report on the incident. The cruise ship, which had set sail from Galveston, a port city still bustling with tourists flocking to attractions like Moody Gardens and the recently opened Schlitterbahn Water Park, was now the center of a tragic narrative. As the news of the discovery reached the ship, passengers who had been enjoying amenities such as the ship's ice skating rink and mini golf course were struck by a palpable sense of disbelief. The vacationers, many of whom were Texans looking to escape the early summer heat, were now witnesses to a real-life drama unfolding in the midst of their leisure. The serene morning of June 15, 2001, aboard the Voyager of the Seas was abruptly shattered when word of Ray Truscott's untimely death reached the ship's captain. Within hours, the vessel, a floating city that boasted a rock-climbing wall and an opulent dining hall, transformed into a somber crime scene. The U.S. Coast Guard, alongside the FBI, tasked with investigating crimes on international waters, quickly dispatched their best agents to the ship, which was now anchored off the coast of Galveston, Texas. Detective Kareen Henning and Detective George Givens were among the first to arrive. Henning, with a reputation for her unerring gut instinct, and Givens, known for his methodical approach to crime-solving, stepped onto the ship with a sense of urgency. The media frenzy had already begun, with outlets broadcasting live updates, fueling public interest and speculation. The detectives made their way to Stateroom 7156, the last known location of the victim. 
To their seasoned eyes, the interior of the room appeared undisturbed, the bed neatly made, and personal effects arranged as if awaiting their owner's return. However, the balcony presented a stark contrast, chairs were overturned, and a single glass lay shattered, its fragments catching the morning light, a silent testament to the struggle that had occurred. The crime scene was meticulously processed. Forensic teams dusted for fingerprints, combed through fibers, and collected DNA samples, while the ship's CCTV footage was seized for review. The investigators' presence was a solemn reminder to the passengers that their idyllic retreat had been breached by violence. As the investigation unfolded, the world outside continued its pace. In the background, faint sounds could be heard from the ship's onboard entertainment system, a hit song of the time, now a jarring soundtrack to a tragedy. The detectives, unfazed by the ship's grandeur or the distractions of the media, focused on the grim task at hand, piecing together the final moments of Ray Truscott's life and identifying his killer. As the Voyager of the Seas remained anchored, a mere silhouette against the June sky, the investigation into Ray Truscott's death turned to those closest to him. Dinah Truscott, 51, the victim's wife of 20 years, became the focus of intense scrutiny. Known for her gentle demeanor and her role as a devoted homemaker, Dinah was the archetype of suburban tranquility in Plano, Texas, a city that prided itself on being one of the best places to live in America. According to a CNN Money Magazine feature that year, Dinah's life was seemingly filled with PDA meetings and Sunday family barbecues. Her dreams were modest, a happy family, a comfortable home, and the joy of seeing her children succeed. Yet, beneath the veneer of domestic bliss, detectives wondered if there lay a motive for murder. The interrogation was conducted away from the prying eyes of the public, who were busy discussing the case on internet forums, a burgeoning trend in the early 2000s. Detectives Henning and Givens, in a room with views of the endless ocean, questioned Dinah. Her responses were punctuated by moments of confusion and long pauses. She struggled to account for her whereabouts at the time her husband was believed to have been thrown overboard. Her alibi, that she had been asleep in their stateroom, offered little in the way of corroboration. Despite her seemingly oblivious nature, Dinah's reactions during the interrogation raised suspicion. Was her demeanor a mask for something more sinister, or simply the shock of a grieving widow? The detectives took note of her every word and gesture, aware that in cases such as these, the truth was often hidden in plain sight. As the investigation continued, the question remained, was Dinah Truscott a heartbroken spouse or a cunning adversary? The inquiry into Ray Truscott's death intensified as the focus shifted to Bob Hackles, a 56-year-old colleague of the victim. Hackles, a seasoned insurance analyst at New Life Financial, was aboard the Voyager of the Seas with his family. His outward persona was that of an affable family man, yet beneath this facade was a clandestine relationship with Ray that, if exposed, could upend his life. Hackles' presence on the cruise was ostensibly for leisure, alongside his Russian wife, Irina, and their two children. However, investigators suspected that his true motive may have been rooted in the tangled web of his secret romantic involvement with the victim. The early 2000s were a time of contrasting attitudes towards such relationships, with television shows like Will and Grace bringing LGBTQ themes into mainstream media. Yet many still faced societal pressures to conform to traditional family structures. During the interrogation, Hackles maintained a calm exterior, answering questions with measured responses. Hackles was unflappable, even as detectives probed for a crack in his composure, seeking to understand the nature of his relationship with Ray and the potential for jealousy or betrayal to have driven him to murder. The police were methodical in their approach, aware that the success of shows like CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, which had captivated audiences with its portrayal of forensic science, had raised public expectations for swift and conclusive detective work. They scrutinized Hackles' alibi cross-referencing it with witness statements and security footage, determined to uncover whether his calm was a facade for a more turbulent inner turmoil. As the investigation delved deeper, the question loomed. Could Bob Hackles, the man who shared whispered confidences and stolen moments with Ray Truscott, be capable of ending the life of the man he loved? On June 17, 2001, two days after the discovery of Ray Truscott's body, a new piece of evidence surfaced aboard the Voyager of the Seas. The morning was marked by a gentle gulf breeze as a crew member, performing routine maintenance along the starboard side of the ship, noticed something unusual. Caught on a piece of protruding metalwork was a fragment of fabric, navy blue, with a distinctive pattern that matched a shirt belonging to Bob Hackles, one of the prime suspects in the case. 
The finding was a potential turning point in the investigation, a tangible clue in a case that had thus far offered few. The fragment was immediately secured and sent for forensic analysis, with the hope that it might yield DNA or other materials that could link the suspect to the crime scene. The media, always hungry for a new angle on the story, began to speculate on the implications of this development. The FBI agents, well-versed in the nuances of evidence collection and its role in building a case, treated the discovery with the gravity it deserved. The weather, which had been a mix of sun and cloud, seemed to mirror the uncertainty that hung over the ship as passengers and crew alike pondered the significance of the find. As the news of the fabric fragment reached the mainland, it became a topic of discussion on news programs, where anchors dissected the latest developments with legal experts. The cruise ship, once a symbol of escape and relaxation, had become the backdrop for a narrative that was as gripping as any summer blockbuster, with the added weight of real-world consequence. The investigators, for their part, continued their meticulous work, aware that in the world of criminal justice, unlike the instant gratification of winning a game of who wants to be a millionaire, patience and thoroughness were the keys to uncovering the truth. The investigation's next chapter unfolded as attention turned to Carl Bauhines, a 49-year-old librarian from Largo, Florida, whose connection to Ray Truscott added another layer of complexity to the case. Carl, a seemingly unassuming man, was revealed to have been entwined in a secret romantic liaison with Ray, a fact unknown to both Dinah Truscott and Bob Hackles, the other suspects in this unfolding drama. On board the Voyager of the Seas, Carl's demeanor stood in contrast to the ship's vibrant atmosphere, which typically buzzed with the excitement of vacationing families and couples. His quiet, introspective nature belied the depth of his involvement with Ray, and as the FBI delved into his background, they uncovered a man who dreamed of a life less ordinary. Yearning for acceptance in a world that was just beginning to embrace diversity in love and relationships. In the interview room, Carl's emotions were palpable. He vacillated between anger and profound sadness, his dreams of a future with Ray now irreparably shattered. For Carl, there was no escape from the harsh glare of suspicion that now shone upon him. His responses to the FBI's probing questions were tinged with desperation as he struggled to reconcile his clandestine relationship with the brutal end it had met. As the investigation wore on, the public followed the case with the same fervor as they did the unfolding saga of Gary Condit and Chandra Levy, a scandal that dominated the news cycles. The question on everyone's mind was whether Carl Bauhines, a man who sought solace in the quiet corridors of a library, could be capable of a crime as loud as murder. The investigation aboard the Voyager of the Seas culminated in a revelation that pierced the veil of mystery surrounding Ray Truscott's death. Bob Hackles, a 56-year-old insurance analyst and secret romantic partner of the victim, emerged as the perpetrator. The evidence painstakingly gathered by the FBI pointed irrefutably to a crime of passion, a fatal encounter that transpired against the backdrop of the ship's grandeur and the Gulf of Mexico's expanse. Bob, known for his convivial demeanor and professional success, was a man whose outward life belied the turmoil within. His dreams of a concealed relationship with Ray, free from the scrutiny of society and the constraints of his own family, had been dashed by Ray's intention to leave him for Carl Bauhines. The revelation had ignited a rage in Bob that culminated in a violent confrontation, ending with Ray's body being cast into the ocean's depths. The method was as brutal as it was definitive Bob had pushed Ray from the balcony of their stateroom after a heated argument. The motive was clear, a mixture of jealousy, fear, and the unbearable prospect of losing Ray to another. The crime, devoid of weapons or premeditation, was an impulsive act that forever altered the course of several lives. As the news of the murderer's identity spread, the story became a subject of intense media scrutiny. Outlets like the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal typically focused on the economic downturn and the recently introduced tax cuts by President George W. Bush now found space on their front pages for the sordid details of the case. Bob Hackles, once a respected member of his professional community, now faced the stark reality of his actions. His life, once interwoven with the fabric of rays, had unraveled in a moment of uncontrolled fury. The question of why a man would commit such an act hung heavily in the air, a reminder of the fragile nature of the human psyche. The climactic turn in the investigation aboard the Voyager of the Seas came on the morning of June 20, 2001. The skies above Galveston, Texas, were overcast, a somber reflection of the proceedings on the ship below. Bob Hackles, a 56-year-old insurance analyst and the man now known to have ended Ray Truscott's life, was taken into custody. 
The arrest, executed with precision by the FBI, was the culmination of days of meticulous investigation and evidence gathering. Hackles, who had maintained a veneer of composure throughout the interrogation process, met his fate with a quiet resignation. There was no dramatic outburst or plea for innocence. Instead, he seemed to have accepted the reality of his situation, perhaps aware that the weight of the evidence against him left little room for denial. The news of the arrest spread rapidly, with networks breaking into their regular programming to report the latest development. As Hackles was escorted off the ship in handcuffs, the passengers, who had been enjoying amenities like the ship's casino and Broadway-style shows, were now silent witnesses to the stark reality of justice being served. The atmosphere was charged with a mix of relief and morbid curiosity. Dinah Truscott and her children, who had boarded the cruise to celebrate a milestone anniversary, were left to grapple with a complex mix of emotions. The revelation of Ray's secret life and the identity of his killer had torn through their family, leaving them to face a future marred by tragedy and public scrutiny. The trial of Bob Hackles, set against the backdrop of a post, Y2K America grappling with the tremors of a shifting global landscape, commenced with the gravity befitting a case that had captured the nation's attention. The courtroom, often a stage for the dramas of human conflict, was packed with journalists, each racing to feed the public's appetite for updates, much like the frenzy surrounding the release of Apple's iPod later that year. A device that promised to revolutionize the way we consumed media. Prosecutor Angelo Argelia, a seasoned attorney with a reputation for his relentless pursuit of justice, presented a narrative of betrayal and jealousy that had culminated in the tragic death of Ray Truscott. He painted Hackles as a man whose facade of normalcy was shattered by the revelation of his secret relationship and the prospect of its end. The defense, led by the astute Janet Pringles, countered with an appeal to the jury's sense of compassion, framing Hackles' actions as those of a man driven to the brink by emotional turmoil, not unlike the characters in the popular primetime drama. The Sopranos, which delved into the complexities of the human psyche. As the trial unfolded, the victim's family sat in the gallery, their presence a silent testament to their loss. The emotional toll on Dinah Truscott and her children was palpable, their grief compounded by the media circus that had descended upon their private tragedy. The verdict, when it came, was unanimous, guilty. The sentencing followed, with Hackles receiving a punishment that some deemed harsh, others lenient, but all recognized as the irreversible conclusion to a series of irrevocable choices. The courtroom, which had been a crucible of tension, released a collective breath as justice was pronounced. The aftermath of the verdict rippled through the Truscott family and friends, their reactions a mosaic of relief, vindication, and unending sorrow. The case, which had unfolded alongside the country's preoccupation with events like the brewing storm over the Enron scandal, left an indelible mark on all who had been touched by it. In the wake of the trial that concluded with Bob Hackle's conviction, the individuals connected to the tragedy aboard the Voyager of the Seas began the arduous process of moving forward. The Truscott family, their private grief made public, sought solace in the routines of daily life. Dinah Truscott, once planning for an anniversary celebration, now faced the daunting task of rebuilding her family's world without Ray. The children grappled with the dual loss of their father and the family's untarnished image. Detective Corrine Henning and Detective George Givens, the law enforcement duo who had pieced together the case, continued their careers with the FBI, each carrying the weight of the Truscott case as a somber reminder of the complexities hidden within human relationships. The case had tested their resolve and proven their dedication to uncovering the truth. Carl Bauheins returned to his life in Largo, Florida, his brief and secret romance with Ray now a closed chapter, its details buried in court documents and news archives. He sought anonymity, a return to the quietude of his profession, away from the sensationalism that had briefly thrust him into the public eye. The world outside, meanwhile, carried on at its relentless pace. The stock market, which had been in a state of flux since the dot-com bubble burst, continued to ebb and flow, a reflection of the nation's economic uncertainties. Brands like Nokia and Motorola dominated the mobile phone market, their devices a ubiquitous presence in the hands of those eager to stay connected in an increasingly digital age. As the years passed, the memory of the case faded from the public consciousness, replaced by new headlines and scandals. Yet for those directly affected by the tragedy, the echoes of the past remained. They moved through their lives, each day a step further from the events on the ship, but forever aware of the indelible mark left by the case of Ray Truscott. As we close this chapter of True Crime Case Files, we're reminded of the unpredictable nature of the human heart. A voyage that began with celebration ended in tragedy, 
leaving us to ponder the line between love and obsession. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the depths of passion and peril. Until next time, keep a watchful eye on the mysteries that surround us. Hey, true crime case solvers, interested in more real-life murder mysteries? Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. And do you have any thoughts about this case or have a case of your own you'd like us to investigate? Leave us a comment. Until then, stay safe true crime case solvers.